we'll dive right into the discussion in a moment, um, but I'm thrilled that Coach Johnson is with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to Thank have you. you here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Why don't you just take a seat there. So, Coach, we've been for the last two days talking about the growth of Walker and Dunlop. We've talked about the core values at Walker and Dunlop as it relates to being a company with a lot of tenacity, a lot of drive, a lot of community and culture. Your career in professional sports as both an athlete as well as a coach um, sort of has embodied a lot of those key characteristics. Uh, I want to start with, tell us a little bit about your upbringing in Louisiana and high school basketball into going to junior college and going to three universities before <laughs> actually graduating from Southern University. But talk a little bit to start this off as it relates to your upbringing in, uh, in, in Louisiana and uh, what sets you on the trajectory to where you are today. Well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for having me. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Dallas. And um, I've been living here in Dallas for the last uh, four months relocated here to Dallas after coaching college basketball at the University of Alabama. And I'm glad to be back in the state of Texas. So welcome and thank you very much for, for having me. Great to have um, you. I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, I'm one of uh, 10 kids. I'm number nine. Um, my, both of my parents have passed away, Jimmy and Inez Johnson, but uh, grew up in New Orleans, went to uh, St. Augustine High School, uh, in New Orleans, and I didn't want to go to St. Augustine High School. I wanted to go to Booker T. Washington uh, High School because St. Augustine High School was very, very problematic for me. But my uneducated parents, uh, both with fourth grade education, forced me to go to St. Augustine High School. But St. Augustine High School was very problematic. One, uh, it was an all-boys school. <laughs> Two, you had to wear a tie every day. And, um, and, and it was a Catholic school, and I didn't know much about the Catholic religion. But fortunately, I went to St. Augustine High School, um, won a state championship there in 1983. Uh, I was the last man on the team. We had a 15-member team. I was the 15th man. They used to actually call me Little 30 because they only put me in the game when they were up by 30 points. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is a... <laughs> Your own self-deprecating self is, uh, I think, one of the beauties of your personality and also one of the keys to your success. So you end up going to junior college. You weren't recruited by one of the major universities to go play for them. Talk a little bit about the journey through college because you were a good basketball player, but you weren't highly recruited out of, out of high school. So how was that journey through junior college and then the transfer to another university and then ending up at Southern University? Yeah, that journey was pretty interesting because in 1983, I only received one scholarship, and that was to New Mexico Junior College, and that's in Hobbs, New Mexico, where there's a famous shell play that's taking place now called the Permium Shell Play. But I went to New Mexico Junior College, transferred to Cameron University, which is in Lawton, Oklahoma, didn't have much success there, and eventually transferred to Southern University in Baton Rouge, uh, where my high school coach was an assistant coach and fortunately played there two years, led the nation in assists in 1988. The rec my record still stands today. Nobody's ever averaged 13.3 assists uh, in a college basketball season. And, uh, but that journey was tough. Um, got knocked down quite a bit um, and finally landed on my feet at Southern University. And uh, we went to the tournament two years in a row. Uh, my junior year, we played against Temple, and then my senior year, we played against the uh, University of Kentucky. But in fortune, unfortunately, I didn't get drafted, but fortunately, a guy named Bernie Bickerstaff from a team that was called the Seattle Supersonics gave me a tryout. I tried out for the team in 1988, and, and I, I was the last man to make that roster, and that led to my 16-year NBA career. So before we jump to the NBA career, I want to ask, so you're – one of 10 kids, yeah. you're at college in New Mexico and then in Oklahoma. Um, how much support did you get from your parents and from your siblings as it relates to working your way through moving from university to university and um, just, you know, with 10 kids and your parents in Louisiana, 
Explain a little bit about how much you had to work to find a, kind of find your own path, or was there somebody or some people who helped you get through that? Well, my, my parents, as I alluded to earlier, weren't college graduates, and my mom eventually went to back to high school when she was in her mid-50s to get... And she graduated from high school like when she was 54 or something? Yes, exactly, yeah. yes. She went back, and we were all proud of her uh, for that moment, but what they lacked in education, my, my parents made up for it with discipline and love and hard work, and my dad was a self-employed uh, carpenter, and I saw him every day working 12 hours a day to support the family. So I had a great support system, even you know in the inner city, and being raised in the projects of New Orleans, they, they just made up for it with a lot of integrity and strong character traits. And then I also had some coaches along the way, my age, AU coach, uh, Joe Ormond, who lives here in Dallas. He's 79 years old, and, and uh, he's in failing health right now, but I went to visit him last week. He was very instrumental. My high school coaches were very instrumental. Um, I, a couple of my brothers who played sports, they were very supportive. So I just had a good support system that even though I was going through some very difficult times uh, in my collegiate career early on, I could always call on some family or some friends or some coaches to encourage me along the way. So you've gotten your shot at the NBA. You're going into, I guess, what you'd call minor league NBA at that time when you first got that call from the Sonics kind yeah. of feeder system. Yeah. And now you've made it onto an NBA team and you're playing for the San Antonio Spurs. David Robinson is there. Yeah. Talk a little bit about joining that team with somebody who is as acclaimed a player as David Robinson and how you fit into that being somebody who was not drafted, who worked his way onto this team that was very quickly becoming one of the great franchises in NBA history. Well, at first it was very intimidating because David had such an illustrious career up until that point. He was an perennial all-star. Here's a guy that graduated from the Naval Academy, uh, a mathematics major, very smart, um, uh, you know, a religious guy, intense, uh, but it was intimidating at first, but David was the guy that welcomed me to the team, made me feel right at home. Uh, I had to spend some time with him living in his home early on until I got on my feet. But um, it, it, David was a guy that just welcomed me to the team and basically helped nurture my leadership early on by allowing me to lead him, uh, even though he was the captain of the team. So. He was a guy that took great care of me. And a funny story about David, David, David was the guy that was obviously the you know, highest paid player on the team. But for some strange reason, when we went out to dinner, he always forgot his wallet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I always had to pick up the tab. So I said, you know what? I'm going to uh, correct this problem. We're going to always have dinner in the hotel so you can sign it to your room. <laughs> So um, Greg Popovich was, I believe, the either president or general manager of the team before becoming the coach of the team and obviously became one of the great coaches in NBA history. Um, when you're on the team, you've got David Robinson, Tim Duncan, I think, came the following year to the team. But what was it about Popovich and his coaching style that you immediately saw, you obviously know him much better and can kind of look back, but I'm trying to put you back in the early 90s, You've, you're on the team. Yeah. When Coach Popovich takes over, what was it immediately that said to you, this guy is different, the way he's coaching this team is different from other coaches that you've worked with? Popovich, his background is at the Air Force Academy. And he was a guy that was all about the small, minor details uh, being a large part of your success. So whether it was the basic fundamentals of basketball, the way you pass the basketball, the way you practice, uh, spacing on the floor, uh, playing unselfish, being in the right position at the right time, uh, Whatever it was, all of the small minor details that sometimes coaches skip over to focus on the, the larger parts of the game, 
that wasn't Popovich. So we never could get by by making, by making small mistakes. The small mistakes were the big mistakes. And he, he was a guy that uh, was very, very detailed. It was about discipline. Uh, it, it, he was about determination, never allowing an uh, opponent to outwork us or outthink us. So I think that w those were the things that really attracted me to, to his coaching style. And one could think attracted him to you because that's the way you played your entire career. Is that correct? That's correct because, you know, when I was played in the NBA, you know, and I'm 5'10 or 5'11. I think I'm 5'11 today. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when you've played in 13 of 100 games, more games than anybody under six feet tall, and I wasn't a guy that was very imposing physically or, you know, I wasn't the most athletic guy. So I had to make up for it with basketball IQ and toughness and leadership and, and being a coach on the floor. And that's why they called me the little general. They called David Robinson the admiral. So I was the little general. So our personalities, um, we, we were attracted to each other because we, Popovich and I stood for the same things in terms of how to run a basketball team, how our team should function on the court, and how we should also function off the court as a family. I, one of the guys were talking about a Sports Illustrated article about our legendary dinners uh, as a team after wins and losses on the road because we believed in family and chemistry. So a lot of what Popovich stand, stood for on the court in terms of his coaching style, I was very attracted to it because it was similar to my, my style as a player and eventually when I became a coach. And when you were your senior year in, in college, you were the first Division I basketball player to have uh, to be in double digits on both points and assists per game. And you mentioned your 13.2 average assists per game, and you were also above 10 points per game on average. As a pro player, were you looked to to mostly be the distribution player and assisting people, or did you keep up as well on the scoring side? And how was that shift from playing in the, in the, in the, in the college ranks to playing on, in the NBA? Well, the, first of all, the shift was tough because when I was playing in college, when I would drive to the basket, I would go in for a layup pretty much uncontested, or if somebody came over to help, I could still lay it up with no problem. Early on in my NBA career, I had to learn how to elevate my shots a lot higher because now you're playing against Patrick Ewing, Hakeem Olajuwon, eventually guys like Shaquille O'Neal. So you, you had to find ways to be a little bit more craftier in terms of scoring in the paint. But when I first entered the NBA, I was strictly an assist guy strictly an assist guy, and eventually I had to develop an outside jump shot. I was never really a three-point shooter, but I had to find spots on the floor where I could be effective, especially when uh, our opponents double-teamed Tim Duncan or David Robinson, or when I played here with Dirk Nowitzki towards the end of my career, I had to develop an outside shot. And fortunately, I developed an outside shot that led to the Spurs' uh, first championship in 1999 when I was open for a jump shot in Madison Square Garden. So why don't you take us to that moment? Uh, so you talked about Patrick Ewing. You talked about the jump shot. Um, you're in the huddle, there's seven or maybe nine seconds left in the game. Coach is drafting out a play for you to do. Yeah. Tell me that coach said, all right, it's gonna go over to Johnson in the corner. <laughs> no, 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 no. So <laughs> walk me through what the actual play was and how it ended up getting to you in the corner to sink that jump no, shot. No, I was the last option. <laughs> <laughs> I was the last option. Uh, Tim Duncan was the first option. David Robinson was the second option. Sean Elliott was the third option. Mario, uh, uh, d d Mario Elliott was the fourth option. I was definitely the fifth option. But the play was called four down. And the play was designed for Sean Elliott to pop out to the wing, the left wing. I was supposed to hit Sean Elliott, which I did. And we entered the ball to Tim Duncan, and Tim Duncan is to get the ball, score it, and win the game for us. But I remember telling Tim Duncan, or as a team, we told Tim Duncan when he was obviously the best player on the team, we said, listen, when we run four down, 
and you have what we call single coverage, just his man guarding him, single coverage. We told Tim Duncan, score the ball. We said, if you get double teamed, if they bring a double, uh, another player over the support, do not pass it, score the ball. <laughs> and we said, if, if there's a triple team, then you can pass it. So the, the Knicks, Double to triple team Tim Duncan. They got confused in their rotation. Tim Duncan kicked the ball out to Sean Elliott. The defense shifted over to the right side uh, where, Mar where Mario Elliott and David Robinson were standing. And everybody shifted away from me. And I was left alone in the left corner at about 16 feet. Sean Elliott passed the ball back to me. And I just caught it and shot it. I didn't even think about it. Fortunately, it went in and led us to our first championship. Yeah, it's just great. If, if you haven't got, I would suggest not now, but afterwards, both YouTube, the, that actual shot, because it's pretty great. It's a shot that went down in the history of the San Antonio Spurs. But then also, if you can afterwards, pull up Dan Patrick's interview with Avery right afterwards, because the, the excitement in you in that mm. interview is just, I mean, it's not only palpable, it's just so, it's just pure joy. Yeah. You, you just, you're right there, you did something that you sort of didn't think you'd ever have the opportunity to do, and you've just won the world championship, and he's interviewing you. And it's very interesting as well. You and, you and Dan knew each other quite well, because it was probably one of the more sort of engaging post-championship interviews I've ever seen. I mean, he sat there with you and talked to, how, how much had you worked with the press and built relationships with the press as you were going through your pro career? I, I was always one of the guys that was you know, media friendly yep. when I was playing in San Antonio or, or any of the teams that I played for. Uh, I always thought you know, guys in the media, they have a job to do. So I wanted to always make sure that I gave them a little bit more than what they were asking so that they could be successful at their jobs. And eventually when I went to work for ESPN or now I'm, I work for CBS Sports, um, I understand how both sides work. Uh, but I was really passionate in that interview because I, a couple of things were going through my mind. Uh, I was thinking about all of the people that invested in me uh, as a person, uh, all, every teacher uh, that, that, that taught me in school, every coach that coached me, even whether it was in baseball or basketball, everybody that invested in me, my family. I thought about all of the Spurs fans because for years it was always about the Boston Celtics or the Los Angeles Lakers. But here comes this little small market team in San Antonio with this vibrant and passionate fan base that loves their team. And I was thinking about all of those Spurs fans that were disappointed in 1995 when we lost to the Houston Rockets in the Western Conference Finals when we had the best team in the NBA, 62 and 20, and we got upset in the Western Conference Finals and all of those 40,000 fans that showed up at the Alamo Dome, the supporters. So that shot was more than just about Avery Johnson. It was about my teammates and coaches and all of the people that I alluded to that invested in us. So that's why I was so passionate in that interview. I hear him say that, and I just stop for a moment and ask myself, how many professional athletes at that moment where they've just won the world title are thinking about other people other than themselves? thinking about all the people who've invested in them to get them there and are conscious at that moment when the spotlights are on them of I'm thankful for all those other things that have put me here rather than I'm the man or I'm the woman. It's really, I mean, it's, 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 um, it's wonderful to hear you say that, but it is also so much about your character and what has made your career as successful as it has been to deal with adversity, to have that tenacity, to have the love and care of your parents in a very large family, and to carry all of that with you to that moment where most people in that spotlight would just say, thanks very much, I'm, I did it. And, and that's the same thing that I try to teach my kids. You have to be others-minded instead of being self-centered because your blessings and your rewards are going to come when you think about other people first, and whether it's you know, family members or friends, but when you're selfish and you're only thinking about yourself, uh, you're not going to be successful in the world. 
And I have two kids, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have a 24-year-old son, Avery Johnson Jr., that played for me at the University of Alabama. He just graduated uh, both with his undergraduate degree and master's degree, and he works for a new startup uh, sports marketing company. And then I have a 26-year-old daughter um, that works for the largest investment company in the world, BlackRock Investments. And uh, she'll, uh, she's doing great. I'm so proud of both of them. But I, I teach, one of the things that I've done over, right over the years is I've taught them how to think about other people first. So let's transition for a moment from the playing career into the coaching career. Uh, because you um, entered the coaching. Talk, talk for a moment about going from being a player to being a coach. Um, because as, as we all know, um, there's, that's got to be a big transition where basically you're kind of to some degree being told what to do and now you're charting the course. But you're also working with pro athletes who probably don't like a whole lot of guidance on what they're doing. Uh, and your, your, your coaching career was extremely successful taking the Mavericks all the way to the NBA Finals. Um, so talk about the, the challenge from transitioning from a player to being a coach and then the more broad challenges of just being a coach of pro athletes. Yeah. Well, the challenge going from a player to a coach uh, is you don't really have as much control during the course of a game as you did when, you, when, when I was a player. When you're playing, you know, you, I'm dribbling the basketball, I'm passing it, or I'm playing defense. So I'm, I control my diet, my off-season training, and I have a direct impact on the game because I'm on the court. If, you know, com I commit a foul or maybe I draw a foul on the defense. But when you're a coach, uh, even though you're drawing up different schemes, you're putting together practice plans, you're, tr you're trying to lead a group of men to execute a certain philosophy, uh, you're, you're impacting the culture directly. Uh, you just don't have as much control because you're not on the court. So you're trying to teach and mentor and lead and direct a group of young men to try to help them be successful on both ends of the floor, trying to help them, encourage them so that they can get a new contract and improve their lifestyle or family way of living. It, it's, it's just different. You're just, you just don't have as much direct control, but indirectly you're trying to have an impact on the game. And as it relates to the coaching career at the pro ranks and then going into the college ranks, um, you get to the NBA finals. Um, Why did you make the decision to move from pro coaching to college coaching? It was pretty interesting. Over the years when I was coaching the Mavericks and also uh, the New Jersey slash Brooklyn Nets, I was always receiving inquiries through my agency um, of my engaging my interest to coach college. And eventually I got a call from a Pac-12 um, athletic director and a Big 12 athletic director. And when I was in between coaching the Nets in Alabama working for ESPN, uh, my agent called me and said, hey, I think you should talk to the uh, athletic director from the University of Alabama, it's pretty interesting. So I sat down and talked to him and it, it, it just, it was a great fit because I thought I would have an opportunity to mentor young men, help show them what a father and a husband looks like every day in action, uh, have a chance to be a big brother, uh, a coach, and you know, help kids that were first generation, become first generation graduates from college. And we had a 100% graduation rate at Alabama. Thank you. A kid that I identified his talents in ninth grade, Colin Sexton is now, uh, we recruited him to Alabama, a football school. He's now the starting point guard for the Cleveland Cavaliers. I got two others playing in the G League, but really just wanted to model uh, what a hardworking uh, husband and father and, and, and mentor those kids. So that really attracted me to college and uh, academics and compliance, and I'm glad I did it. 
but it's different coaching in college because you wear so many different hats. And it's 365 days a year, um, seven days a week, and it's recruiting and dealing with donors and fundraising. But we, we wanted to help Alabama basketball get back on its feet. We did that. I had a great four-year run, but now I'm excited about this next chapter in my life, working for CBS Sports, consulting with some different companies in the oil and gas space, also in the multifamily real estate space. I think some of your, um, uh, some of the folks that work here was actually visiting with a company called Luring Capital that I consult with. So it's just, um, it's, it's a fascinating time in my life right now doing what I'm doing, but coaching in college and coaching in the NBA even though it's a round ball and a 10-foot goal, it's, it's totally different. So I want to I wanna stick on college coaching for a moment because all the things that you just walked through, all the things that drew you to it, would make me think that you would have been a wildly successful college coach. Mm -hmm. the, the track record at Alabama says that you were a good college coach mm -hmm. and you went to the dance, but you weren't a great college coach. Mm -hmm. So as you reflect back on that, all those things you talked about, going and meeting with families and recruiting kids and talking to parents about your own story and about a focus on academics and a focus on what you could get if you came to the University of Alabama, all of that would seem to me to be a great recipe for success at the college level. So as you look back on all those various parts, what's the piece that didn't happen? Well, to be very transparent, I had some unbelievable parents and the kids worked, they worked extremely hard. Uh, my coaching staff worked hard. But if I had to do it all over again, um, I would spend even more time with my players. When you go to a school that's a football school, you know, you have to get out and raise money and raise the awareness uh, of the program and spend so much time doing other things besides basketball. Uh, you have to fundraise because when I got to Alabama, they only had $50,000 in their basketball gift fund. We raised almost $2 million over in the first uh, year or two uh, at Alabama, but that was because I was out raising money. So I think if I had to do it all over again, I would spend even more time with my players, one-on-one -on -one meetings, mentoring them even more than what I did because they – sign with Alabama to spend time with Avery Johnson, not just with my assistant coaching staff. And then two, uh, in terms of recruiting, to be brutally honest, when we go to recruit a kid, especially in high school, we normally go to his practice or his game. If I had to do it all over again, I would spend a little bit more time interviewing the history teacher or the biology teacher, because on our level of Power Five basketball, especially when you compete competing against the schools like Kentucky and Kansas and all these different schools, if you don't have the five-star player and you have the four-star player, you have to have players that can have really a high level of critical thinking and that can perform on the big stage and problem solve on the floor. And that's not directly always attributed to athletic ability, but but just IQ. So I think I would spend a little bit more time interviewing the biology teacher, uh, the counselors, just trying to figure out how kids process information because on our level we have to process it and process it fast. Speaking of that, did you find any Avery Johnsons when you were out recruiting? Is there anybody who came and played for you you said, I see in that player a lot of me? Because you're obviously going out trying to find the David Robinsons of the world, if you will. Mm -hmm but your own career would say that you also knew what the key characteristics were to finding someone like you. Did you find any Avery Johnsons along the way? I did. There's a kid that I recruited um, that's at Alabama now. His name is Herb Jones, and um, he, he's just a kid that's a bright kid, hard worker. You know, he's a little bit taller. He's about 6'7", but, <laughs> 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 but he, he just reminded me of myself outside of my son, but when I, looked in, when I looked at Herb, it was like I was looking in the mirror. Uh, he's a galvanizing type of a kid, great leader. 
Um, he worked awfully hard. You know, he spent endless hours in the gym trying to perfect his craft. He was left-handed. I'm left-handed. But uh, he was a kid that, um, that was just a great leader, serious competitive, competitive spirit and uh, strong character. Uh, he was a kid that had high integrity and uh, he had a really good moral compass. Talk a little bit about your son playing for you. I'm certain your son could have gone on and played D1 basketball at multiple schools. There was a decision there that said, come play for me. And that both has the great benefit of your coaching your son and that great experience. It also has the, hey, coach left his kid in the game for too long because he's not playing well today. And if it wasn't his son, he would have put somebody else in there. We've all dealt with that in youth athletics, those of us who've coached youth teams. But you're at a very large level there. You're at the top level as it relates to that. And people expect a certain sort of line, if you will, at that level as it relates to, okay, if your son should be in there, darn right, put him in there. But if he shouldn't be in there, he should be on the bench. How'd you, what, what, was, what went into the decision of saying, come play for me? And then how'd that work out as it was during his career at Alabama and you coaching him? It, it, it was tough. It, was all, it wasn't always sunny. Uh, we had a lot of thunderstorms, and not just from the outside, but again, I'm married to his mom, and moms want their kids to play. <laughs> and I have to sleep next to his mother, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I do. I do. <laughs> but to, to keep it PG, um, <laughs> it's, you know, I never coached Avery Jr., you know, and when Avery was growing up playing uh, basketball and he was also a tennis player, we, we always had the 30 minute rule. Once, once he got in the car, we never talked about his game for the first 30 minutes because I wanted him to calm down. Uh, I never, I was expressionless at his games. I, I never really sat with his mom because all eyes was on me, whether he made a great play or turned the ball over. F you know, parents always wanted to see how I was going to react, and I had no reaction. So when he got in the car, we never talked about his game. I just say, great, you know, good job, and we talk about something else. But Avery Jr. signed with Texas A&M out of high school and played there for one year, and then when I got the job at Alabama, we we made the decision for him to transfer and play for me at Alabama. And we had a lot of good moments and bad moments in practice and games. And there were times, you know, um, you know he would play well during the game and I would be a, a you know, proud dad and coach. And I tried to not get caught up in the moment in terms of being his dad. I tried to coach him as best I could. But you're, you're right. It's tough when you have to coach your son and especially if there's another kid at his position that's better than your son. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when Colin Sexton is now in the NBA, uh, my son's working in corporate America. But, you know, it's, it's, it's different. There's a lot of dynamics that go into that. You get a lot of mean tweets yeah. from fans, especially if he has a bad game. It seemed like his, when he has a bad game, the tweets are multiplied. Uh, by the thousands, and then if he has a good game, you know, I don't get any negative tweets. So it's, it's, it was a tough deal. I'm glad we got through it. I think it made us closer as a, it brought us closer as a family. Um, talk about the relationship with Coach Saban. Coach Saban's come and spoken at a Walker Dunlop conference before. Um, he's obviously legendary. Uh, he obviously has the program, which he's executed on very well. Um, I've watched interviews that you had of talking about that relationship with Coach Saban uh, and you being very respectful that he had a big job and as much as the two of you would talk about various things together, you know, he had a football team to both recruit to and to manage and you had a basketball team to recruit to and manage. But um, talk a little bit about Coach Saban being in the same sort of, if you will, orbit as Coach Saban and spending four years um, in the same athletic facility with him and what that was like, both good and bad. Well, the great part about it, or the good part about it was, he welcomed me with open arms, um, and his wife and my wife became uh, really close, and they still are close. And I, I still have a great relationship with him. He was very important in terms of our recruiting, because when parents and prospective student athletes came to visit the University of Alabama, uh, we showed them all of our wonderful facilities that we were improving. Uh, we had an incredible schedule. Uh, we improved our travel. And we took it to first class VIP level. 
we did a lot, we, we improved the whole overall experience for the student athlete in terms of basketball uh, that they had ever seen in the, in the last 20 years. But when a prospective student athlete and his parents came to campus and he was one of those five-star elite players, we ha allowed him to meet with Coach Saban and that was a critical part of our success and the way he met with our parents and prospective student athletes and encouraged them uh, to join our program was vital to our success. When I met with him, I used to go and meet with him on every other Thursday. When we met, we never really talked about basketball or football. We talked a lot about culture. We talked a lot about responsibilities of assistant coaches, uh, connectivity uh, with our players. We talked about taking care of the ball, whether it was a football or a basketball, because turnovers hurt you in both sports. Uh, we, we talked about, um, you know, mental health challenges that players are going through, which is a big topic right now, and how you deal with some of those problems of helping kids that were dealing with, you know, anxiety and, and fears and how to coach them up and build, up, build their confidence. So it, it was some pretty interesting meetings that we had, and I, I'll never forget uh, and always appreciate our time together. So you had very extensive interaction with arguably two of the greatest coaches of this generation in Greg Popovich as well as Nick Saban. Is there anything common between those two in the way that they either approach their job, approach their players, that would, you know, would say to somebody with a with kind of from afar, there's there's one key element to them. It's a it's a competitive drive. It's looking at the game in a different way. It's the interaction with the players and doing the dinners that Popovich did. And there's an analogy on the Saban side. Is there anything there that you can sort of look at that says, you know, they their 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 records are their records because of this? Well, I, I think both of those guys, to sum up both of them. Here's how I'll put it. They, they do not get intoxicated by success or paralyzed by failure. That's how they're, that's how they're twins. Whenever there's a moment of success, they do not, they're not arrogant about it. They're not in, their personalities do not become inflated. Um, they, they're, they're never full of themselves. And when they fail, they don't allow that failure to hinder them from trying to figure out that the particular problem and getting back on their feet and trying it all over again. So that's what I think about those guys. They're never really intoxicated by success or paralyzed by failure, and they're not going to let you fail. Uh, that's one of the things Popovich told me, even though I was undrafted, uh, the shortest player on the team. That's what he used to tell me all the time. You're going to be successful. I'm not going to help you, let you fail. You just have to trust that I, have, that I know more about what I'm talking about than you do. And if you trust me, we can, we can be successful together. So taking that from the coaching ranks down to the player ranks, you played with many, many, many stars in the NBA. Who was the best person to play with? Wow, that's a tough one because I've played with Dirk and Tim, Tim and, David. and David and Hakeem. But I, I would say D Tim Duncan is the best player I've ever played with. So I was hoping you'd say that. So why? Well, number one, he was the hardest working player. He, Tim and Dirk are 1A and 1B in terms of work ethic. But Tim was the hardest working player, arguably, that I've played with. Uh, and he was always the best player on the biggest stage, and he always came true. And, you know, five championships. Enough said. Five championships. Playoffs uh, every single year he played Playoffs, the yeah. Uh, best power forward in the history of, of the NBA. Uh, unselfish. And he allowed Popovich to coach him harder than anybody on the team. And when your best player allows the coach to coach him the hardest and then he comes through, it's just magical what, what he did. But, but again, you know, to see what Dirk did, even though he's been to the finals twice, won a championship, best European player, he basically um, 
when you talk about the stretch four position, what he did, best European player ever, I, I, those guys are kind of 1A and 1B. And when you did something that was, quote unquote, where you failed Tim Duncan, the pass didn't go in, the shot didn't go in. What was Tim's reaction to you when something didn't happen? Well, he always looked at you funny, but he... <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Tim, his leadership was nonverbal. Right. His, his leadership was nonverbal. It was the stare. Um, it was that look that I can't believe you didn't execute at that time, and I'm very disappointed with you, but I love you. So his, his was more <laughs> nonverbal. Mine was always verbal, probably to a fault, but his, his was nonverbal. But can you talk about that for just a second? Because, I mean, most of us think that leadership comes from sort of words and actions. And here's this amazing leader who basically didn't use words or actions other than facial expression to tell you what he thought. How, I mean, I, I've, I've never worked with anyone who can just, I mean, I got plenty of colleagues of mine who yeah. will look across a table at me in a certain way and yeah. I know, oh, they're mad at me or I didn't do something right. But I mean, you're playing, you're playing basketball and he doesn't come over and say, How, you know, why didn't you pass me the ball? He just looks at you. What? The great thing about the successful teams that I've been a part of and the really great players that are great leaders uh, that I've had a chance to uh, teammates with at the highest level, they always treat you like a partner. They don't, they don't treat you like you're one of the lesser guys on the team. Your, your partners. Uh, even when I was coaching here with the Mavericks, Mark Cuban never really treated me like a coach. I was always like a partner. Uh, the Holt family in San Antonio, it wasn't like they were the owners and Popovich was the coach and we were the players. We were partners. And that's one of the things that I loved about Tim Duncan. He was a superstar but we were partners. And when you let him down, uh, that, that stare and, and the nonverbal was so powerful. Um, it, but we talked about it a afterwards at dinner. And, and, but me as a coach or as a player, I, I was more verbal. My, my leadership comes out in different voices. My uh, loving voice, teaching voice, disappointing voice, intense voice. So verbal leadership can come out in a lot of different ways, but his was more nonverbal. Um, two, two, two final things, and then I want to wrap up. Um, the first is that there's a, there was an interview I watched when you were at the University of Alabama where a member of the press asked you a question that I guess struck you as not the smartest question ever asked. And you sort of called him out on it and said, why don't you answer that for me? And you kind of got in this back and forth. Well, that's when I was coaching the Mavericks in the finals. Oh, it was the Mavericks yeah. in the finals. Sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm conflating yeah. Yeah, your career. Yeah. But, um, you know, you've had a lot of, uh, I mean, you've been under the spotlight your entire career. You've had to take a deep breath at certain times. How'd you build the discipline to not react, if you will, to things that people said or did that would push you backwards or or, or, or hit a button? How did, you, how did you build up that discipline that's made it so that Avery Johnson has had such a long and consistent career without having those moments? There's a guy named Herm Edwards who used to work, who was a colleague of mine uh, when I worked in the media at ESPN. He's the head football coach at Arizona State. And Herm has a f famous simple quote that says, be careful before you hit sin. He was given a speech to uh, I think a bunch of college kids years ago when he was working in the media. And he was talking about specifically social media. So whether it was Twitter or Instagram, he just said, be careful before you hit sin. Uh, I've adopted that philosophy uh, in terms of the way I communicate, specifically with uh, players, uh, when I was a, you know, teammates, in my family, because it's very important. Your words are powerful. Um, and I always tr think about that thought, be careful before I hit sin. I'm not literally hitting a button, but it's the words that are coming out of our mouth, my mouth, because I think those words are powerful. Those words can lift somebody up, tear somebody down. It can encourage somebody or challenge somebody. It, words can be very destructive. So I try to be careful before 
I, I hid sin because my words are very powerful. Can I give you one quick story? Please. I know we're, I know we're wrapping up, but my daughter, um, asked me when she was a junior in high school to take her on a trip to go visit some schools on the East Coast because she, she was born in Houston, but she didn't want to go to school in Texas. She didn't want to go to school in the South. So I took her on a trip on the East Coast. We did, we did seven schools in five days. So we toured Duke, North Carolina. Uh, we went to Virginia, Georgetown. Uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Columbia, and Yale, all in one week. And that's what she wanted to do, and she wanted to do it because I always told her she was special. I say, Christiane, you're special. You can do whatever you want to do in, in life because you're special. So we came back from this trip. I say, what do you think? She said, Dad, I want to go to the University of Pennsylvania. I say, no problem. Let's go to the at, office at your school, start filling out all the information. So basically she told the counselor that she wanted to go to University of Pennsylvania. She called me a couple of days later when I was working, my daughter was in tears and she said, Dad, um, the counselor told me I shouldn't apply to the University of Pennsylvania because for my talent level, that's called a significant reach. She said I should apply to Spelman uh, historically black school in Atlanta. And I said, no, you're special, let's apply. Because I've been telling her my words are powerful, you're special. So she applied to the University of Pennsylvania. I had a talk with the counselor and said, just allow us to go through the process. So she applied to the University of Pennsylvania because of my words that were powerful. She graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in Mandarin Chinese, business economics through the Wharton School of Business, and a minor in geology because of somebody's words. So I was, I was very careful before I hit sin. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's, uh, you said your, your daughter is special, you are special, your career is special. And I would just say on behalf of everyone at Walker and Dunlop, thank you for spending time with us this morning and sharing your story with us. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Coach. It was great. Just what I wanted. Thank you. Thank you.